Let me say good morning to you. Good morning again. Uh, I am several minutes late. It's about 9.29. Uh, if you'll give me the grace to start a little bit behind, I'll make sure that we kind of make up for it on the back end. Had a couple of things to take care of this morning. And when you know, when it rains, it always pours. So good to have everyone with us. We'll start maybe around 9.35 just to give everyone an opportunity to come and to be a part of what we're doing this morning. Uh, we're going to begin uh, our Sunday school lesson. Uh, the lesson is entitled, The Way, The Truth, and The Life, coming from John chapter 14, verses one through 14, that famous chapter that I'm sure many of us are familiar with. So if you don't mind, when you log on, just say good morning and say hello to everyone and we will be getting started uh, shortly. Once again, I do apologize for the time delay. Uh, I do not like being late, but unfortunately it does happen from time to time. So I wanna begin also by saying Happy New Year to all of you. I pray that everyone is doing fine. I hope that you are in good health. I hope that you enjoyed the Christmas celebration. I hope you had a safe and wonderful time on the New Year celebration. And I hope you had a chance to visit with your family, at least by phone, if nothing else, just to let everyone know you still miss them and you're still thinking about them. For those that uh, don't know me, my name is Rodney Smith Sr. and I pastor New Hebron Missionary Baptist Church where God has blessed me to be for 14 years now. Now the good news is, in spite of all of the technical difficulties from this morning, the good news is, Lord willing, we'll be having our in-person church services beginning next Sunday. Yes, amen for that. Go ahead and type in your amens for that because I can't wait to be there. Hopefully everyone else will be just as excited as I am to come out and we'll be able to worship together and learn God's word together. I'll go ahead and give you this kind of a time uh, uh, stamp now, I'll say time stamp, but give you the times of our services. Our Sunday school will begin at its regular time at 930, as well as our morning worship will begin at its regular time at 1045. Because of the unique conditions we are in with COVID, uh, we just, we have a sanctuary, thank you, Lord, that is large enough so we will just have one general adult class in the sanctuary. Uh, we'll ask that the parents stay with the kids, the kids stay with the parents, and that way you'll be responsible for kind of watching the kids, or if you have to step out with them for a moment, we'll leave that responsibility to the parents. But we will just have a general Sunday school teaching, general Sunday school class, and that will be held in the sanctuary. The morning worship will begin at 1045 and the service will be somewhat abbreviated and we'll go over all those things when you arrive on Sunday morning. So I look forward to seeing all of you there. Hopefully everyone will be ready, will be uh, excited. Uh, Lord knows I'm excited. Now I'm going to say this, there have been a lot of people who've been saying, I'm ready to go back. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. Well, now it's time. The proof is in the pudding. There's been a lot of I'm ready talk. Let's see if we get some I'm ready show up, Lord willing. So this is the first Sunday of the year. Don't forget, we're going to be observing the Lord's communion. We'll be going back to in-person services starting next Sunday. And if you remember, next week. Next week will be the first in-person service of the year. And for the month of January... We'll go back on the second Sunday and the fourth Sunday. Starting in February, we'll go to first and third every month thereafter until we see what we're working with, who's comfortable attending, and then we can expand and adjust as we go forward. So I'm excited. I hope that you are excited. I can't wait to see your faces. I can't wait to be with you. I can't wait to hear a few amens also. Hopefully, I'll get a couple of them. So I want to say good morning to you, uh, Sister Long, and to my Aunt Rosetta. 
uh, John and Tanya, my cousins. Uh, we have about one minute. Sister Bonita Lane, God bless you. To all of the others that I have, haven't mentioned as of yet, we're certainly thankful to have you as well, Sister Verdi Davis and others. So we have made it to 935. Lord bless us. We are five minutes behind. So we're going to go ahead and get started at this time. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 14. We're going to look at verses 1 through 11, as well as, make sure I have this here. If you have the adult book, it is the lesson for January the 2nd, and today's the first Sunday of this new year of January. So we're going to thank the Lord, and we're going to start off with God's word and a bit of prayer. If you can take a moment, let's pause, let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to go into the study of God's word. So let's pray together. Father, we come to you and we thank you. Thank you for being kind. Thank you for being just. Thank you for being fair. Thank you for the favor that you have given to us all of the last year. In fact, God, even the mercy that you've given in waking us up to see a brand new day. As we assemble together for the first time in this new year, our heart goes back and we look back. There are so many who were with us last year at this time who are not with us now. We pray, Lord, that you can heal the broken hearts, that you can give peace to a confused mind, and that you, and that you can help us as this local body to always stay focused on you and to remain united and huddle around each other, especially in times like these. As we open your word to study this morning, we ask you for grace to understand. I ask you for the grace to be able to teach it. I pray, Lord, that you can use me as an instrument uh, in your service, that you can receive the praise, the honor, and the glory. We ask you this in the name of Jesus. And they all said, amen, amen, and amen. Happy New Year again to all of you. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 11. Um, many of us are familiar with these verses but if you'll allow me, at least on this morning, let me read these verses because these are some very uh, famous verses that have helped many of us get through difficult times. John 14 and 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go, you know, and you know the way. Thomas says unto him, Lord, we know not where you're going, and how can we know the way? I love the response of Jesus in verse 6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should known, should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Philip says unto him, Lord, show us the Father as it suffices us. Sister Walla, look at what Jesus says in verse 9. Have you been so long with me uh, so long time have I, excuse me, been so long time with you, and yet you has not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, showest us the Father? That King James Version just gets me, y'all. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me. He does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. That's a lot, but yet it needs to be a lot because there's a lot to cover right there. And we're looking at the way, the truth, and the life. So this particular text, what it does is it, it's kind of in the heel, on the heels of a bigger context. This is Jesus in the upper room having a final discourse with his disciples. 
I believe it even says in our Sunday school lesson, believe in me, the opening sentence of that paragraph, chapters 13 through 17, record what occurred in the upper room at Jesus' final Passover. Now, in chapter 13, we have some interesting events. And context is cleared up when we kind of flow into chapter 14 as we leave chapter 13. In chapter 14, uh, excuse me, chapter 13, verse 1, it talks about Jesus knowing that his hour had come. Now, when it speaks of his hour, that's a phrase that refers to his impending crucifixion, his impending trials, his impending death. He knew that the moment was on the rise. This time slot on God's divine calendar was about to arrive. It wouldn't be long before he died. His hour had come. And in chapter 13 and following verses, that's when he washes and wipes his disciples' feet. And after he does that, he gives a brief teaching. And as they're sitting around the table, the tables were not like ours where they had tables with chairs. They had a very low table surrounded by pillows and cushions, and they would lean and lay. And even to some point, they would be so close, and we can see John the disciple that Jesus loved, he would be so close to Jesus as they recline, he would be laying on his chest. So if you can picture someone leaning and laying on their side, they're eating food, they're dipping bread into some kind of a sauce, and they would use that to eat. And in that moment, Jesus singles out Judas as his betrayer. He said, one of you is going to betray me. Each one question, is it me? The one that dips with me in the dish. And Judas was doing it at that time. Jesus began to tell them, in essence, I know who my betrayer is. I know who's going to do it. I know how it's going to come to pass. And he looks at Judas and he says, what you have to do, go do it quickly. The disciples did not immediately know that he was speaking of Judas as a betrayer. In their mind, chapter 13 states, they thought Judas was going to do some charitable work for the poor or because Judas had the bag. He was the treasurer, as it was. Maybe he's going to buy some food or supplies for this Passover. But he left. Listen, you would think in the mind of Judas, it would have sparked something in his mind. The gig is up. Jesus knows what's going on. Didn't do it. That just shows the foolishness of worldly living. So guess what happens? When Judas leaves, in verse 31 of chapter 13, Jesus began preaching even more. He's preaching about him being glorified. He tells them to love one another as I have loved you. And Jesus, what he's doing is, he's letting them know in that discourse, that teaching, that preaching, I'm going to be leaving you now. I'm going to have to leave you but you won't be able to come. Peter in chapter 13, Peter said, Lord, I want to go. Jesus said, you can't go with me now. He said, but I'm leaving. In essence, he was teaching them to die for you. And Peter said, Lord, I, I, I'll die for you. I'll defend you. I'll go to prison. I'll go to death. And at the end of chapter, of chapter 13, verse 38, he kind of predicts, Peter's denial. And we flow into chapter 14. And that's why Jesus says in verse one, let not your heart be troubled. Now, when he's saying, let not your heart be troubled, he's not saying don't allow trouble to come into your mind. You, you, you can't even stop that from happening. You can't stop the concern of difficulties from crowding your mind at times. But what he's saying, I want to make sure I read it here. Uh, in my book, the regular print, page 62, the bottom paragraph on the left, Jesus is not telling his disciples to merely put troubling thoughts out of their minds, but rather he's wanting them to see those troubling thoughts in the new light of their eternal hope in him. So he says, yes, you see trouble on one side, but you see peace and hope and glory in me in the other side. So he says, 
Don't see your troubles just through your clear, carnal, human eyes. See your troubles. See your difficulties through the glory that's going to be revealed in me. Meaning, yes, I'm going to die. Yes, I'm going to leave. But yes, I'm coming back. So don't let the current despair of the moment cause you to be exasperated. Don't let the current despair of the moment cause you to throw in the towel. Don't let your heart be troubled. If you believe in the Lord, believe also in me. Now, see, listen, that's a verse I'm sure that many of us have heard at funerals, or maybe you can call it a homegoing celebration. That's a verse I'm sure many of us have read and gained inspiration from. But people, that is true. Don't let your heart be troubled. Yes, you're going through a tough time. Yes, you're going through a difficult time. Yes, you're going through a time that seems like you can't see any light at the end of the tunnel. But there is a God that sits high and looks low. And even though it's bad right now, where you are is not where you're going. The way things are, are not the way things will always be. Don't let your heart be troubled. The same God that we believe in, you can believe in Jesus to fix it as well. Now, when he says, if you believe in God, believe also in me, that's also a phrase that speaks to the deity of Christ. That is the divinity of Christ. That is the holiness of Christ. He's not just a man. He is the God man. Remember how Isaiah prophesied about him and the names that would be laid at his feet? The mighty God. He shall be called in some places Emmanuel, which means God with us. They even call him Jehovah because he is the self-existent God. He is God because he is worshipped as God. He is God. Because he forgives sin as only God can. And we learned last week that a time will come to where every knee will bow. Every tongue shall confess. Confess what? That Jesus Christ is Lord of all to the glory of God the Father. So the God that we serve, he is not unattached from us. He is not distant from us. He is not in some far away space, some far away place. He has no idea, no clue what we're going through. He's involved in our daily plights to the point to where he doesn't just know about what we're going through. He cares about what we go through and he even commends us to cast our cares on him. Don't let your heart be troubled. Same power God has, the same power I have. If you believe in God, you can believe also in me. That is his divinity. Well, why not? Because in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I wouldn't lie to you. I wouldn't have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. Our lesson has a very good illustration or teaching, I'll say, uh, rendering about mansions because what we think of mansions is some huge home, uh, some huge estate, some huge campus with land and a, a man-made pond and a pool and however many bathrooms and bedrooms and a huge garage. It, it's, it's basically speaking of a dwelling place. And when he says, in my father's house, you can even find this in your lesson under my father's house, the first sentence in that section, it says the father's house, this phrase is generally understood to be heaven. Listen, Jesus is speaking about heaven. He said in heaven are many places to dwell. It doesn't mean that each Christian has an individual home with bedrooms and plumbing and a flat screen TV, living room, etc., etc. No. There's plenty of room for all who believe. When Jesus gives that great call, whosoever will, let him come. If the entire populace 
of people who were ever born and who ever are going to die before he comes back. If everybody believed in Jesus, there would be enough room in heaven to receive them all. This is more so like an invitation to let you know there's plenty of room. There's plenty of space. There's plenty of places. There's plenty of dwelling places. In my father's house, there's plenty of room, many mansions. And he says, I'm not lying to you because if it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now, let me just say, I remember in the past, I've had certain people that would debate that heaven is anywhere Jesus is. Well, if you were with Jesus while he walked on earth, I'm sure because we have the benefit of hindsight, I'm sure because we have the benefit of knowing Old Testament and having a completed New Testament, we would be so excited and we would be so overjoyed. But just being with Jesus is not heaven. Because keep in mind, these 11, Judas is still gone. These 11 are with Jesus and he's speaking of a separate place apart from where they are right now. So to make the statement just because they were with Jesus, any place where Jesus is, it's heaven. It may be poetical. It may be in some ways a beautiful saying. It's not biblically accurate. Heaven is a real place. And coincidentally, hell is a real place. Point being, when we die, I don't care what Oprah says, what Morgan Freeman says. I don't care what the heretics say. We don't just go out of existence. Oh, no, 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 no. Our life, our eternal destination is based up of a sum total of our yes and no's to the Lord. Specifically, our yes and no to having salvation received from Jesus. So heaven is a real place. And it's a place that Jesus has prepared for those that have placed their faith in him. If Paul could step in. The Apostle Paul would say it this way, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those that love him. So Christ here is letting them know about a prepared place. And he says in verse three, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, underline that, and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be with me, the implication is, also. I, uh, there's a lot to, to, to highlight from verse 3, and I don't want to prolong the time needlessly, but I want to emphasize one point from verse 3. Jesus makes a declarative statement, I will come again. Those four words are to put a pep in your step. Those four words are to be jaw dropping. Jaw dropping in this sense. He's coming back. Folk are living as if Christ is never going to return again. People are living like they ain't going to die one day and see him again. We will see him again. If you are alive when he returns, you'll see him. When you die, guess what? You'll stand before him in judgment. We will see him again. He's coming back. We can go further. Looking for a church without a spot or a wrinkle. My mother used to let me watch the kids, my, my kids, my sisters, because I was the older brother. And she would give me responsibilities, you know, and I would do what many children would do. Young people would do waste time. I would be foolish. She would say, sweep the floor, sweep the rug or vacuum the rug, wash dishes. And of course, you put things off until the end. And there would be a couple of times that I would just sit there and watch TV and watch cartoons and watch the prices right, making sure my sisters aren't getting in trouble. And I wouldn't pay attention to time. And sometimes mama would get off work just a little bit earlier than I thought. Or she would get home just slightly earlier than I thought she would. 
And when I would hear those keys in the door or hear that car in the driveway, it was too late. You see, I was lounging, loafing, laying around as if mama wasn't coming home again. And I think that is the state that many people in the world are today. Sadly to say, even some Christians just living how they want, talking how they want, treating people how they want, don't care about church, don't care about prayer, don't care about Sunday school, as if he's not coming back again and you'll see him again. He doesn't want you to serve him out of some fear, but he does want you to respect him enough to obey him and believe him that he's coming back again. He will return. He left on the cloud and he said, the same way you see me leaving, the same way you'll see me returning. And then we get some dialogue in verses four and five. And then we get Jesus's response in verse six. Now, in verses four and five, we see that, uh, who is this here? Thomas is asking a question. He says, and whether I go away, and, and this is Jesus, excuse me, and whether I go, you know, and the way you know. Verse five, Thomas responds by saying, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus responds in verse six, you know the way because I am the way, the truth and the life. You see, there's a bit of confusion in the mind of Thomas. Jesus in verse four is talking about you, uh, uh, you know, I'm going and you know the way. Thomas is saying, what way are you talking? We don't know the way. You see, Thomas's confusion He's thinking of a path. What's the direction? What's the route? What's the street? What's the address? In our terms, my GPS can't find your location. I'm going in circles here. He's speaking of a path to get to Jesus. Jesus is not speaking of a path. He's speaking of a person. He's speaking of himself. You see, Thomas is speaking carnal. Jesus responds spiritual. The way to this prepared place, the way to God's house, the way to heaven is not driving down here, turning left, turning right, going over the bridge, crossing the railroad track. The way to get there is through Jesus. He makes a claim in verse six. I am when he says I am. That is God talk. That is divinity speaking. That is him boldly declaring in the book of John, another one of the I am statements. He says, I am what? The way, the truth, and the life. You get to heaven through me. And he clears that up at the end of verse six. No man comes unto the father except by me. Jesus makes an exclusive claim of salvation through him and him alone. Salvation is granted to the person that believes only in Jesus. That's a controversial statement in today's time. Controversial because people don't want to accept it. And people don't want to accept it partially because the culture gives you so many options, partially because of the hardness of our hearts, partially because we don't want to say that God and his standards are the only way because those ways don't suit what I want to do and how I want to live. So that's not going to be the way I'm going to find me another way. According to the Bible, any other way except for Jesus is wrong. I don't make that claim. Jesus makes that claim. I don't make that statement. Jesus makes that statement. That's not hyperbole. That's not some riddle to interpret. That is plain, straightforward teaching. Well, somebody says, well, what about all of the people that believe this? What about all the people that believe you get to heaven in that way? What about all of the people that believe you get to heaven in a third way? I, Jesus is the only way. It, it, it doesn't matter 
the, the response sometime that you garner when you make this exclusive claim of salvation that Jesus makes, which is only through him, the response that you sometimes garner is, I know you're not calling my mama a lie. I know you're not saying my daddy was wrong. I know you're not saying my daughter, who I raised in church, and, and, and now she's burning sage and, and speaks more about uh, 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 zodiac signs than she does the Bible. I know you're not saying my baby's wrong. I'm not saying anything. Jesus is saying any way to heaven apart from him is wrong. That's why he says no man, no man, woman, boy or girl, no person comes to the father except by me. Now, Jesus makes salvation as an exclusive uh, right that only comes through believing in him. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Notice he says a man, meaning person. Not dog. Not cat. Not your favorite plant. You see, these things, inanimate objects, plant life, and even the animals, they don't have a redeemable soul. So, no and I don't want to hurt anyone's feeling here, but no, your, 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 your dog not going to heaven with you. Cat show ain't going to heaven. Joking. Truthfully, but you see my point. Your dog ain't going to heaven. Your cat show ain't going. Your hamster ain't going. Your horse ain't going. Your pet whatever ain't going. No man even is not going except they put their faith in Christ. So what he's saying here, he makes an exclusive claim of salvation. Verse seven, if you had known me, he said, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. Verses eight and nine. These are verses that ring so true to me because in my, I, I was young and I was spiritually growing. I was spiritually immature. And you know how when you're young in the faith and new to the faith and you wrestle to debate your faith, you may not have all the right answers. And I've learned over time, you can't really respond to a critic of scripture just on passion alone. You can't go with mouth, teeth, and gum. You must have book, chapter, and verse and make sure they are in context. And there was someone, a neighbor of mine, that did not believe that Jesus was the son of God. He believed that he was separate from God. He was a good guy. And I put him off for a long time. And he showed up at my house, woke me up out of my sleep at my apartment, living on Woodbridge, at Woodbridge Apartments on John Barrow. And he came with a notebook sheet of paper, front and back, all of these scriptures, front and back, about Jesus being the firstborn of creation and showing Jesus with scriptures taken out of context, showing that Jesus was not God. He's separate. He's not the same. And so I just remember looking at the sheet of paper, clearing out the sleep out of my eyes. He was geared up. He had went home and took time doing this. And I got my Sunday school book. Never forget this. And I opened it up, and the lesson was on Philip in John 14, verses 8 and 9. And I remember reading what Philip says in verse 8. Lord, show us the Father to satisfy our thoughts, to satisfy our curiosity, to clear up any misconceptions or misunderstandings. Show us the Father. You just said in verse 7, that if you know, uh, if you have known my father, you've known me. If you know me, you know my father. Philip said, well, show us the father. All this father talk. And Jesus saith unto him, have I been with you so long, Philip, that you have not known me? Another exclusive claim of his divinity. You see, Jesus is God. Please I, I've had people to try to get me to explain the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And there are no examples that are created that can adequately explain it. 
I've heard it say it's like ice. You got ice, you got water, and you got steam. Well, that's true. But how can it be ice, water, and steam at the same time? So we don't have any real examples that can just crack the surface of an understanding. To be honest, that's really just above our pay grade. We may not understand it, but understanding something is not a prerequisite to believing something. Jesus says, I've been with you. You want to see the Father? I've been with you this long, and you haven't known me. Understanding something is not a prerequisite to believing something. You may not understand how gravity works, the physics and the, 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 the way it works, but you know enough not to walk off of a tall building. You may not understand the principle of electricity, electricity, joules and amps and voltages and how they come together in a circuit that forms together. You don't understand it, but you believe it because you know enough not to stick a wet finger in an electric socket. You may not understand how he is the father and he is the son and he is the spirit at the same time, but yet they're still separate, but still equal. I, I, that's above my pay grade. You Listen, you may not understand it, but I still believe it. You see, to try to explain it, you may lose your mind, but to deny him, you could lose your soul. So he says, I've been with you this long and you have not known me, Philip. He says, he that has seen me has seen the father. So how are you going to say then, show us the father? We can see the heart of God in the life of Christ. Listen, people, that's a bold, that's a strong statement. But we see the heart of God in the life of Jesus. Compassion, mercy, justice, judgment, love, forgiveness, favor, kindness, gentleness, but still not a pushover. All of these principles are wrapped up in Jesus Christ. If you've seen the Father, you've seen him. Now, this is, this is a, a lot to kind of unpack in, in a sense, but we have to make sure in our explanation of Christ, his characteristics and his ways, that we don't accentuate certain parts of his character to the detriment of others. He's loving. He is love, the Bible says, but he's not just love. He's merciful. He has so much mercy that his mercies are from everlasting to everlasting, but he's not just mercy. Yes, yes, God can love you and still judge you. Yes, God can be merciful and still punish you. Yes, God can favor you and give you grace, but still take you and kick you off your high horse and put you in your place. The same way we, this is a very, very loose example. There's not many ways to truly adequately explain it, but one tip of the iceberg way, it's the same way you can love your child and still be so upset and disappointed at them when you see them do some foolish things. Yes, I love you. And you may not see or understand my love because I'm upset with you at the choices you're making, the stuff you're doing. Because what you're doing is just flat out wrong. It, it, it bothers me because you were raised better. You were taught better. You know better, but you're still doing it. My anger and frustration don't mean I don't love you. As a matter of fact, my anger and frustration are fueled by the fact that I do love you because in this moment, in this situation, I want better for you than you want for yourself. You don't see that that act is harmful. You don't see that going that route is the wrong way. You don't see that what you're doing is foolish. And sometimes you do see it's foolish and you still do it. And that hurts me and angers me even more. But I still love you. In that context, if we can put those lenses in and see how God does to us, he doesn't condone our sin, but he still commends us. He still blesses us. He doesn't want us to do wrong. But sometimes when we did do wrong and evil was on every hand, he still blesses us. He doesn't want us to choose evil. 
But sometimes we slip into sin. Sometimes we dive into sin. And sometimes he'll, he'll love us and still punish us. Because whom the Lord loves, he does chasten or correct. As a matter of fact, when you get outside of God's plan, God's will, when you walk contrary to God's word, and God begins to discipline you in small ways. It may start as a dribble. It can end up as a flood. But God shows you you belong to him because he's spanking you behind. Point being, it's difficult when we see God and we emphasize certain parts of his character to the detriment of other parts of his character. He said, but when you've seen the father, you've seen me. Now, verses 10 and 11, we got to have some fun right here. Y'all stay with me. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. Believe me that I am, another I am statement, declaring his divinity. I am in the Father. And the father in me. Now, now watch this last phrase. Stay with me. Or else believe me for my very work's sake. Whew. He said, listen, there's a whole lot I'm saying about believing in me. There's a whole lot I'm saying about believing me. Believe in me. Believe in me. I'm in the Father. The Father's in me. Don't you believe it? How could you not believe it? Show you the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There's a whole bunch of talk about belief. He said, you may not understand my words. Okay? You may not even agree with my words. Okay? But can you at least believe me at the end of verse 11? For my work's sake? Mm. Deacon Gardner would always say it this way. What I hear, I forget. What I see, I remember. You see, talk is cheap at the end of the day. They may say Jesus in their mind. They may not verbalize it this way. But Jesus, you're doing a whole bunch of talk about who you are and the Father in you and you the Father. Let not your heart be troubled. Whole bunch of talk. But Jesus said, I didn't just talk the talk. I can also walk the walk. Don't you see and know that you can trust me? Don't you see and know that you can believe in me? Don't you see and know that you should obey me? If not for what I say, for my work's sake. And when he says his work's sake, he's not talking about just helping somebody across the street who's elderly. It's speaking specifically about his miracles. The miracles that Christ performed set him apart from anyone who claimed to be sent by God. Because who else, y'all walk the road with me, who else can walk on water? Who else can raise the dead? Who else can take a child, John chapter 9, that was born blind and give him sight? He said, all I know is I once was blind and now I see. Who else can cure leprosy? Modern day Hansen's disease. It was an incurable disease and lepers were sent to leper colonies. Kids would throw rocks at lepers. Lepers would have to announce themselves when they came into a social circle. Leper, leper, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. Stay away from me. Who else can cure leprosy? Who else? Could die one Friday. Y'all better stay with me here. Nails in their hands and feet. Lifted on an old rugged cross. With a sign over their head that said, here is the king of the Jews. Can hang there from the sixth until the ninth hour. While he hanging there, save one of the thieves that beside him and said, on this day. You'll be with me in paradise. Look down and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Look up to heaven and say, into thy hands I commend my spirit and hang his head in the locks of his shoulder and give up the ghost. And that same person, early Sunday morning, can get up from the grave 
with all power in his hand to the point to where when the women came to the tomb looking for Jesus, the angel said, he's living. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Who else can do these things? The miracles Jesus performed. These miracles, turning water into wine from the first miracle on, these miracles were to validate and to authenticate that he truly was a spokesman for God. He said, you may have a problem with me for what I say. You may not believe what I'm talking about. You may not understand what I'm talking about. It may be above your head, above your pay grade. You may not like what I'm talking about, but can't you look at what I do? And say, can't nobody do that but the Lord. Who can forgive sins but God alone? That's the truth. That's why he can forgive sins. And this culminates in the fact that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. He is our Savior. And he deserves to be praised. If you're out there and... You're struggling with sin. No, no, no. Every person does. And Christians, you know, if you just be honest, every one of us does too. The flesh for the Christian is the beachhead where Satan launches his attacks. He comes down the shore of the world. He pulls up on the beachhead of our flesh and put thoughts in your mind and stuff that you need to do. Tempts you, entice you. He does that through the flesh. Every Christian deals with it. But guess what? To the unsaved, they struggle with it as well. To the unsaved without Christ, at best, you're putting pause on sin. You can't stop sin without Jesus. You certainly can't be delivered from it without Christ because he's the only way that these things can be done. If you can do it without him, then you would not need him. And the claims that Christ makes would all be false. But to the unsaved, if all you do to an unsaved person is to stop them from, you know, you know, sexual sin. Stop having kids. You know, you, you, you're not married, young man. Or stop having kids. You're not, not, you're not married, young woman. Fornication. And, and, and you help them with all these principles from the Bible to get them to stop and, and to remain celibate until they're married. Well, that means without Christ, they're going to hell celibate. My point is... You can't clean the fish before you catch it. So to anyone out there that's struggling with the weight of sin and something from today's lesson about Christ being the only way to salvation has convicted your heart and it causes you to want to say you're sorry to God, that you feel remorseful, that you are broken over your sin, there's a man named Jesus that can take you from your sin. And if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and if you believe in your heart that God has raised him, him being Jesus, from the dead, you shall be saved. Point being, if you believe that Jesus lived and died and lived a perfect life and shed his blood and spread that blood and shed that blood to pay for, atone for the sins that you've committed, past, present, and future, if you believe that to the point, not to where it's a math problem, that you understand, but it's a man that loves you so much and you believe it to where it humbles your heart. If you believe that, you can be saved. You can fall on your knees and you may not know the words. You may not know the fancy verbiage that you hear some people use in church, but you can, hear, you can just say, Lord, I'm sorry. This is not the life for me. I want to change. Now, let me just say this. That's a better prayer that some people pray in church than being going to church for 20 years. Using fancy words, you have to have a dictionary sometime to understand what folks talking about when they're praying. Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Give me another chance. However you verbalize that and invite him to let, to let the spirit work in your life, he'll change you. And friend, if you can pray that, not these specific words, there is no quote unquote sinner's prayer. There's just a prayer of repentance when your heart has been convicted, when you look at the price that was paid for you on Calvary's cross and you know you didn't deserve it, but he did it for you anyway. And it humbles you to the point to where you want to serve that God that's been so good to you and you're so unworthy of it. That's called salvation to the Christian 
who's lapsing, having a flat spot. You do good, then you do bad. You do better, then you do worse. Every time you would go forward, evil is present on every hand. You take one step forward, take three steps backward. Listen, you can give your life. I say give your life to Christ. You've done that. You can repent of your sins as well. Because if you confess with your mouth, you know, and believe in your heart, and you ask God to truly forgive you, God can cleanse you too. We don't serve a God that holds a grudge. He's not like we are. And I'm so glad that he's not. So I appreciate your time today. I'll give you a few moments to collect yourself. We're going to be back. We completed our sermon series last Sunday. So we're not beginning a sermon series today. But we do have a message I feel that can be beneficial to all of us because it's from God's word. Lord knows going over everything has been beneficial to me. So we'll come back in just about 15 minutes or so and we'll learn God's word a little bit more and go a little bit further. We're going to be in the Old Testament, Lord willing, at 1045. So I look forward to seeing all of you back again. Text somebody and say, hey, wake up. We're having church at 1045. So God bless you. God keep you. It's my prayer until we meet again.